Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled Addiction in America History. And we're joined by Claire D. Clark, who is a professor at the University of Kentucky. My name is Andy Mink, and I am the Vice President for Education Programs. I'm joining you tonight actually from just outside of uh, Midtown Atlanta, not too far, Claire, where you got your PhD at Emory, I think. Um, and it's a reminder to me of how uh, wonderful technology is that allows us to have these conversations from literally all over the country. Um, I always see my uh, my Los Angeles uh, entourage here. It's good to see everybody from California, likely those who have just finished teaching and closed their, their doors. But I see a lot of other uh, names and faces that uh, either have attended a lot of webinars or other events that we've had. Brian Johnson down in Arkansas. Um, it's it's wonderful to see uh, Rye Curry up in D.C. with us um, and Holly over in Chapel Hill. So again, thank you for spending uh, your, your night with us. This is essentially work after work. And it's nice that you're able to, to join us. I did think that it would be important for you to also, uh, for me to acknowledge other members of our team who helped make this webinar series so successful and I hope relevant. Uh, Libby Taylor is the coordinator of events and Libby is probably your primary contact with the webinar series and the certificates afterwards. Uh, Libby is a you know, fantastic sort of behind the scenes manager of, of this whole process and I really do appreciate all of her help. Her shoes are so big though that I'm, I'm actually in them tonight. So if you need to text me or message me directly, I actually had to log in under Libby Taylor uh, because I'm out of town and using a different computer. So uh, if, you, if you need some kind of backend help, uh, write to Libby and it'll come to me. I also wanna thank Mike Williams for being a part of the team. He's the education manager. Uh, Mike taught for 10 years in Warren County, North Carolina, Libby for a handful of years uh, of English in Wake Forest. Um, it's really important for us to have an education team that also is really clear about the realities of being a teacher, of the responsibilities and um, and the context of, of teacher leadership. And I hope that all the work we share with you reflects that. The webinar tonight um, is going to be an audio only webinar and we will have a PowerPoint, the one you're looking at that drives the conversation. It's really important though that we hear from you. And so in the bottom part of the go to training control panel, you'll see the chat box. And that chat box is where we'd like you to introduce yourself. We'd like you to make comments on uh, some of the things that we're talking about. We'd like you to respond to open-ended questions, share resources, share thoughts, and ask questions. My job as the moderator is to keep an eye on that box and to bring those questions into the conversation with Claire. Um, if for some reason the conversation really gets running fast and your, your question or your comment sort of zips out of view and scrolls up, please don't hesitate to write it again or to draw my attention to it in some form or fashion. Uh, the National Humanities Center is now in our 41st year of supporting humanities scholarship and education. Um, each year we have a fellowship class of somewhere between 35 and 40 university professionals who apply to be a part of our program and if selected move to Durham and come to that building every single day. Uh, these are elite scholars. These are folks who are really pushing and advancing our understanding of the world through the humanities. And, uh, and from their year with us, from Labor Day to Memorial Day, they produce books, they produce uh, essays, they produce digital projects. Our education department then is intended to develop and build bridges from that scholarly world to the world of the classroom. Uh, all of you, I'm sure, are, are dedicated, hardworking, talented educators. Um, in my own teaching experience, I know, though, that the more, the, the more content knowledge I had access to, the more effective I could be. And sometimes, you know, again, no matter how confident we feel in the classroom, that pulls us away from really these in-depth conversations around, around content and understanding. And, and we hope that these webinars bring uh, some of that to you each, each time. We also have a, a free and online repository of lessons and resources. I'd invite you to, to visit this. Um, I think you're gonna see some changes in this in the coming couple of months. So the lessons, the primary source collections and kits, uh, the scholar written essays will still be there, uh, but we're transitioning to a more um, user-friendly uh, platform in which we can uh, bring all of our uh, resources into the same searchable index. Our webinar series continues to be uh, an important way for us to connect scholars and educators. Um, most of our spring sessions have reached capacity, so uh, I would invite you to go back to our website and take a look at that, but it's, I think there's only a handful of sessions probably towards the end of the spring, April and May, that still have some spaces available. We'd love to see you join uh, as many as you can, though. 
Um, likely in probably mid-April, I'll be announcing the 2019-2020 uh, series as well. All these webinars, including tonight's, will be recorded and they're put on our YouTube channel where you can view them afterwards. I think for me, the, the value here may not be viewing the full 90 minutes, but rather finding that five or seven or eight or 10 minute little snippet, little vignette that really corresponds with the PowerPoint. And it's something you could pull out and share with your students or you know, sort of pull into your other instructional uh, planning. So we'd invite you to, to do just that. We also have other free digital resources that connect you with Humanity Scholarship. That includes a podcast series in which educators and scholars discuss and make visible the process of, of doing their work and approaching, uh, approaching their research and their teaching. And it also includes a online course catalog. Uh, currently, we have several courses that are underway. By next August, I hope to have at least these eight or 10 titles that are available multiple times during the year. Um, I think they're, they're highly relevant. They're uh, intended to give you a chance to really dig deeply into these topics um, and spend time with scholars and scholarship and research so that when you emerge, you can uh, really think about ways to take that to your classroom. Uh, we will definitely be offering digital literacy in the classroom again, uh, and the rest of the series that you see is being developed currently. Each one of these has a lead scholar, uh, in most cases, a former fellow at the Humanities Center, and we're looking forward to announcing the registration uh, in the coming months. All the work that I'm describing is informed by a very active and very important teacher advisory council. Folks like Lee Holder uh, give us a chance to really make sure that we're staying relevant and uh, that the work we do is applicable to your work as a teacher. Uh, it's important for us to make sure that everything we do is not done in the, in the silo of the Humanity Center. We will be accepting applications for next year's advisory council probably in early April. And so I keep my eye out uh, uh, for that and, and we'd love to have you uh, join us and contribute your own expertise and experience to our work. If you go to our website, um, maybe after the webinar tonight, you'll be able to download a prior approval form that allows you to uh, collect all of the webinars that you attend and turn these into your administration uh, as a bundle to gain credit for joining us for the, uh, the time that you have. At the end of tonight's webinar, you'll be invited to complete a survey, and once you've done that, you can download your certificate, attach all that to your prior approval form, and you can submit it for your continuing ed or teacher professional development uh, portfolio to your administration or principal or however it works in your district. That's our uh, my framing for the night. Uh, as always, um, I'm pleased to be able to um, serve, uh, sort of offer the National Humanities Center as a as a space, as a hub, as a connecting point between scholar and educator. Tonight I'm joined by Claire D. Clark. Uh, Claire is the Assistant Professor of Behavioral Science and History at the University of Kentucky. Um, Claire, I hope you don't mind that I also put your website uh, on that slide there, but I, I do wanna introduce Claire for a moment and, and really emphasize the, the value of an interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary approach. Um, it's, it's no accident that um, that a topic like this is so relevant and so important in the world we live in today, but it does require more than just the science side or just the history side. And it's that combination that I find to be particularly interesting. Currently, Claire teaches at University of Kentucky and she's an associate, I'm sorry, an assistant professor, you'll be associate soon, assistant professor of behavioral science, secondarily appointed in the Department of History and associated with a, pro with a program for bioethics. Um, I'm really pleased that Claire also brings this credibility. She's an educator. She has more than a decade of interdisciplinary teaching experience and uses humanistic analytical approaches to teach behavioral science and ethics to undergraduates, to medical students, and to graduate students. Claire, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, Claire, I'm gonna welcome you as soon as I unmute you. Claire, thank you for being here, hello. Well, thank you so much for having me, Andy, and I'm so excited to hear what all of our participants think about this topic and what they think about the readings um, and resources that we looked at. Um, and I will I will just like to, um, some, some of those years of experience were in the high school classroom as a teacher, so I actually began my career as a high school teacher. And um, don't tell any of my university colleagues, but I think I learned more about teaching in those five years than I have. <laughs> There's, there's no, there's no <laughs> doubt, and I, and I have to ask, just to, to start tonight's conversation, um, 
you went from teaching high school to studying and now teaching and focusing on addiction. Is there some kind of connection there? What 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 do you think sort of led you from one path to the next? Yeah, I um I really kind of stumbled into it. It was a little fortuitous. I um my training in undergrad was in media studies um, and cultural studies, and um. I sort of, when I applied to grad school, I had this very vague idea that I would study therapeutic culture kind of broadly construed. And um, then it, it, it was narrowed over the course of the first year to, um, to looking at addiction and addiction treatment. So a particular type of history of therapy, which um, at the time there, there wasn't really a lot of good historical work on addiction treatment. Um, there's a lot on alcohol and drugs and different types of addiction, which I'm going to try to give a little introduction to tonight, but there wasn't a lot on the treatment side of things. And so, so. I, I, know, I know that you did your work at Emory, which is, uh, I'm very close to Emory right now. Um, how did they respond to your interest in that? Would, were, you, were you literally blazing new territory? Were you sort of defining new um, connections between these programs or was it something that was easily accepted? Oh, no, I, I was actually in an interdisciplinary PhD program, and so it was very much encouraged. Um, and my primary advisor at Emory, Howard Kushner, is a historian of medicine, and um, he's he is really the person that moved me away from doing just purely cultural studies and into doing more kind of empirical or archival research um, and that sort of thing. So. Thank you. So I've given you the mouse square, and uh, you can drive the slides, and I'll keep an eye on the chat box. I, again, really want to encourage everyone to register their thoughts and ask questions, and we'll have a, a good discussion tonight. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Uh, well, so before I get started, I um, owe uh, a thank you to, to some people. Um, first, the National Endowment for the Humanities, who funded a summer institute on addiction in American history last summer. Um, and that really is going to inform a lot of what I'm talking about tonight. And the list of participants are too long um, to, to read out to you in their entirety. But um, a big thank you to all of the scholar, the summer scholars, the educators who brought their wonderful ideas to the institute, all of the visiting faculty who came and shared their expertise, and to the institute's project coordinator. Cody Foster, who made really made the whole thing run. So um, that's where a lot of this content for this webinar comes from, and um, I've, I, I would um, I am indebted to all of these folks um, for their help. So we thought that we would start off tonight by just getting some kind of working definitions and learning a little bit about what brings you to this webinar. Uh, so we're going to start out with a couple of introductory questions. Um, and the first is, how would you define addiction? What does addiction mean to you? So if you're comfortable with it, you can just kind of write it in the chat box, and then um, Andy will moderate a, a discussion about some of our responses. Fantastic. Thank you, Claire. Um, and that's the invitation. So again, the chat box is at the bottom of the Go to Training Control Panel. Uh, you can type in, um, give us your thoughts. How would you define the term addiction? And here, Claire, is where we sit back and let that that silence uh, lead to good answers. Brittany says, lack of control over something, something you need or can't be without, physical or mental dependency. Now it's going pretty quickly. <laughs> mm -hmm. The inability to control an urge or to take, consume, or control. Thanks, Teresa. Compulsion to participate in some kind of act. Thanks, Barbara. Joel inadvertently typed thong in, but I appreciate you changing that. Uh, Mariel, a mental or physical dependency on something that you need to function. Kayla says, dependence on something that uh, you or your body feel you cannot live without. Hey there, Amy, thanks for joining. Jeremiah says, addiction is an un uncontrollable desire to participate in something or to part partake in something. Yeah, there's a lot, there's, the theme here seems to be clear, the, the, uh, that it's something that you can't help yourself from doing, or it may be something that you impulsively don't want to do, but you do anyway. Right. So there's a, a lack of control. I'm seeing that as a theme. And then I'm also seeing some different responses in terms to, you know, is it physical or is it mental, which is why it 
it's such a interdisciplinary topic. Um, so that there's there's a psychological element as well. Oh, emotional, we, <laughs> right? Um, so psychological, emotional, um, you know, yeah. and 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 physical dimension to addiction. It seems like that um, you may be. I mean, well, this is a question to kind of pose to the group. Um, could you be physically addicted to something, but not psychologically addicted to it? That is, could you be physically addicted to something, but not have the sense of compulsion mm. to engage in it? Okay. Or is it really, that, or is it really that sense of compulsion that we see coming up again and again that defines addiction? Daisy's offering addiction something you can do. You do, even though you know you shouldn't. Kayla says absolutely, sugar and caffeine. Okay. <laughs> so, well, that those last couple kind of bring us into our next question, which is, um, what kinds of things can be addictive? So, uh, you know, I, I'm going to talk about alcohol and drugs um, in, in this webinar in the history of alcohol and drugs. But let's see, what, what types of things do you think can be addictive? Are there certain types of things? Anything that activates dopamine in the brain? Um, video games, buying clothes when they aren't needed. Work. exercise, cell phones in the classroom. <laughs> Boy, that digital age has brought a whole different level of addiction, it seems. Social media, food. Caffeine, food, social media, selfies on vacation. <laughs> I know I shouldn't, but I just can't help it. Mm -hmm. Adrenaline. Yeah, Susie says pushing up her glasses, which I'm going to reframe a little bit to mean just some kind of compulsive uh, habit. Is that is that close? Yeah. To that? So, so is a habit. So, so somebody said under addiction, they just said bad habit. It's just another word for a bad habit. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if any habit is is any habit is an addiction. There must be some code words in here. It's funny how I don't I haven't seen anything. I don't think I've seen anything so far that is is defined in that syntax way, right? Sin, S I N, tax. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be talking about drinking and drugs tonight. Esther says sex. Hoarding says Jacqueline. Pulling hair, nail biting. Some kind of compulsion. There, Ginger. I don't think I've seen gambling yet. Interesting. Okay, so well, this is this is a good um, this is a good setup for um, the kind of narrative that we're going to use um, to. Uh, to, to talk about uh, the history of addiction in America, um, which is looking at um, these, the, these changes in sort of governing ideas um, between whether the things that can be addictive are separate things and should be viewed as distinct disorders, or whether they're really all manifestations of the same thing and then how that interacts uh, with other sort of trends throughout American history. Um, Andy, did you want to talk any more about the different types of things or should I move on? Yeah, to I think slide? you can move on. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there are a couple reasons why um, we might want to learn about addiction in American history, and I'd love to hear, hear your reasons as well. Um, the first is it's it's a topic as Andy kind of mentioned at the beginning. It's both timely and enduring, so it seems like a bit of a paradox. But addiction certainly, with the opioid crisis, is all over the news right now. And yet, if I had to wager a guess, I would bet that once the opioid crisis abates, we will have some other 
drug crisis to worry about. So it, it seems to be a topic that, um, you know, there's always some new manifestation of it. Um, and yet at the same time, it, it remains with us. It's, a, it's, it's sort of an intractable problem. Um, so it's something that may be on the minds of your students. Um, the second is that it can provide context for, t t for existing lessons or readings of text. So knowing a little bit about addiction in American history might inform the way that you um, teach about a particular source um, or the way that you put together a particular lesson. It can serve as a standalone unit or it can inspire a final project or assignment. And many of the teachers who participated in our summer seminar did design entire standalone units on addiction, right? Or, um, or final projects um, about it. Uh, and then finally, this is, and this is a little more subtle, probably can't quite be, you know, quantified or put a rubric on, but it can inform your interactions with students or their family members who might have personal experiences with addiction um, just by broadening our, our view of addiction beyond what it looks like in our kind of immediate present. Now, those are a lot of reasons to learn about addiction in American history, but I, in this webinar, I really wanna focus on the providing context for existing lessons or for readings of texts. Um, and that's why I had you, um, I had us all read a couple of texts um, for tonight's webinar, and then we are going to talk about them. So I'll give you a little historical context, and then we will apply it to our readings of the tech of the two uh, texts that you all reviewed. Now, addiction or, or alcohol and drugs comes up in the U.S. history curriculum. It does kind of, it, it pops up, it appears from time to time. Um, the progressive era is, is one place, obviously, where you see it with uh, the temperance movement for national alcohol prohibition, with the emergence of drug regulations and the Food and Drug Act. You might see it come up with changes in trends in migration and immigration as you know different substances are associated with different minority groups and then you see sort of policies um, that align with that such as the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and then, you know, drugs are a political symbol, right? And so, you know, since the 1960s, you could talk about the association of drug taking, you know, with the anti-war movement, anti-Vietnam War movement, or kind of just the Just Say No campaign in the Reagan era as indicative of a kind of right turn in the nation's um, political climate. So these are way places where alcohol and drugs kind of come up periodically in what you might think of as a traditional U.S. history curriculum. But what I would like to, to argue or to introduce you to tonight is that addiction actually also has its own history. So there is a subfield or sub subfield of, of history um, called the history of alcohol and drugs. And the, um, the Alcohol and Drug Society has its own scholarly journal, The Social History of Alcohol and Drugs, um, which of which you read an article that was published in that journal. And it has an academic blog that writes in kind of a, a, a catchier, more, more public scholarship way. Um, and that's Points. And you read uh, analysis of a text that was published on Points. And this association uh, meets every other year. They, they hold a, their own meeting and then they, they meet every year at the um, American Historical Association meeting as well. So if any of you attend that meeting, uh, you are more than welcome to drop in on that special interest group session. So this is a so so this is essentially it's um, these historians argue ab about or debate about or think about what is the narrative of addiction or the narrative of alcohol and drugs. Um, in and of itself. So not as, as a, a subset or a, a, a point that's made under, under, say, a discussion of the progressive era, but what actually is the kind of grand narrative of the history of alcohol, drugs, and addictions. And in uh, this webinar today, I'm going to focus particularly on, you know, the United States since the late 1800s. So can I ask a quick question, Claire? Sure. Um, just in terms of the way that that field has developed, um, alcohol and drugs as addictive behaviors is clearly uh, sort of the one-two, right? It's the, the the primary major focus. 
do you feel like in 2019, uh, in the current contemporary times, would there be other, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, other sort of primary um, addictions that would either go next to alcohol and drugs or even replace it? Well, um, so I, I think that the field is, is beginning to move in that direction. Um, and one of my mentors in grad school, David Courtright, who you read an, an article um, by, has a book coming out that looks at those other types of addictions that came up when we asked people what were addictive. We didn't get a lot of teachers here, you know, typing heroin into the chat box, but right. we get I, we got a lot of Starbucks and video games and things like that. Um, yeah, so uh, so I, I do think that we are starting to look more at non-substance addictions um, and their history and how it may be intertwined with the this kind of narrative that we've been telling about um, illicit or psychoactive substances or um, more medicalized uh, psychoactive substances. And, and then maybe one follow-up question to that. Um, if, if the field began and developed with alcohol and drugs is kind of the, the front facing uh, part of this addiction. Would, was there ever any either support of or, or pushback from the pharmaceutical industry? Oh, you know, I don't, I, I don't, maybe. Yeah. Um, not that I can, th I, I, I mean, not that I can think of off the top yeah, yeah. of my head. Okay. Yeah, we don't, we, we're not very good at getting our research funded. So. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> That's the humanities right there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so what, so, so the text that we looked at um, were a political cartoon and a poem. And what I, I very much hope is that understanding trends and ideas about addiction, alcohol, and drugs since the late 1800s are going to help us when we have our discussions of those texts in just a minute. Um, so I'm just going to briefly review the uh, the secondary source that we read that was published in Social History of Alcohol and Drugs. And this is going to give us our kind of contextual framework for then thinking about the two sources that we looked at. So we read uh, David Courtwright's Mr. Atod's Wild Ride, What Do Alcohol, Tobacco, and Other Drugs Have in Common? And Atod's was a kind of play on, so alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs is a section, a caucus in the American Public Health Association that uh, emerged in the 1990s. And Mr. Atod is a play on Mr. Todd, um, sort of equating him to Mr. Toad, who was a character in the children's book, The Wind in the Willows. And um, if any of you have been to Disneyland or Disney World, it's also a, a Disneyland or Disney World ride. Um, and uh, so what Courtright does is to look at the way our attitudes about alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs have, much like Mr. Toad's wild ride, veered from you know, one side to the other, from em an emphasis on the commonalities between all of these different substances. And yes, e indeed, even you know, in the late 1800s, some behaviors, um, to an emphasis on each of addictions to each of these substances being somewhat um, unique and sort of separate categories, and then back again. Um, so, Mr. Toad um, is, we could argue, he, he might be addicted to fast cars. Um, he's crashed his, he crashed his car seven times. He was admitted to the hospital. He was eventually imprisoned before he escaped. Um, and his wild ride is going to take us um, through from the late 1800s up until the turn of the 20th century. Okay, so um, to begin with, so if we look at this kind of diagram, I'm, what I'm, I'm gonna kind of zoom in on each of these eras and just cover some main points about them before we turn to looking at the sources. Um, so if we look in, in the very beginning, in the late 1800s, um, that line there is, is very close to an emphasis on alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs commonalities. And indeed what researchers and treatment providers would have called those commonalities um, would not have been addiction, but it was a concept called anebriety, which is very similar 
to the sort of brain-based concept of addiction that we have today, although they didn't quite have the science to be able to, to support their claims, um, that researchers then didn't have really had the science to support their claims. Um, but you see, um, it is a unified concept that all of these things, um, cigarettes, smoking, drinking, gambling, even swearing, and even sexual misbehavior, which came up in our chat box earlier, that those things were all um, manifestations of an underlying condition called inebriety, and they were all more or less the same, and they were all subject to sort of moralizing um, policy interventions, right? That we could control these, that these things were uh, appropriate to control through uh, government policies um, and progressive era government policies. Okay, so we zoom back out, we can see that that line goes straight down that, you know, driven by any inebriety until 1910 when Virginia Woolf said in or about December, human character changed. Um, and what changed at the beginning of the 20th century? Well, um, narcotic addiction is criminalized and is increasingly treated as a police problem. So um, it, it becomes split off from um, substances that are more medicalized or more freely available on the market. Um, and smoking begins to be popularized first uh, with World War I. Cigarette smoking spreads um, quite rapidly and advertising begins targeting women. Um, following the repeal of prohibition in 1933, um, alcohol is no longer criminalized and movies start to valorize it and it starts to be widely advertised. And so, you know, in this period, you really, you have a splitting off of a, an understanding of drugs that are bad and dangerous and illegal, like many narcotics, and then a, a real glamorization and even valorization of alcohol and tobacco. And so people who are dependent on those substances are treated quite differently. Um, and, you know, alcoholism comes to be seen as a, a completely different condition than drug addiction even when, you know, a generation or two before they were more or less viewed as the same thing. Claire, um, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to mm -hmm. sort of push in on that just a little bit. May I go back a slide? Let me yes. Go back. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it seems like you're, you're entering some, you know, a pretty interesting blurry line here, which is the same blurry line that uh, came up in my mind when we asked our participants to list those things that you could be addicted to, because, you know, that sense of, either ethics or morality or what's good or bad really does shift based on the law, based on the way we accept things. Um, so, if, you know, it's kind of funny and it's true, but it's kind of funny when we say Starbucks or, um, you know, webinar series or something, but it's not so funny when we say heroin or something, something that's bad, right? So when, when does this, this notion of addiction or this understanding of addiction as a, as a term in a field cross into what's acceptable or what's legal? And how does that impact your understanding of what addiction is? Um, hmm, that I, sense? It's kind of the vocabulary of addiction. Um, I, I think by definition, when we were asking folks for definitions, yeah. I think um, I saw a theme come up where most people said it's um, people doing something that they don't want to do. People right. something something that went that goes against their morals that they feel is bad that they feel compelled to do anyway. So so um, let, me push, let me push right there. So it's it's something that people feel is bad, but you can so but you can be addicted to exercise or there was a, certainly a time where you could smoke cigarettes four packs a day and you didn't feel bad about it because you didn't think it was a bad thing to do, right? Right. Um, and, and so I, I think that that's certainly what you see happening here with right. cigarettes. Um, I think at, with alcohol, it's a little trickier because um, what happens with alcohol after repeal and then, you know, in the late 1930s, you see the emergence of 12 steps in AA is, you know, that the sort of hardline temperance advocates felt that alcohol um, was you know, like hard drugs, it was just bad to have in the free market and um, we should really restrict and, and limit access to it for everyone. Um, 
with with once after prohibition, once you have the emergence of groups like AA, there starts to be this discourse around, well, most people can drink normally, drink healthfully. It's only the small subset of people who have a problem with it. And right. that's and, and that's how um, that's how alcoholism begins to be characterized, that it's not a wide scale social problem that applies to everyone. But it's just, you know, for um, for whatever um, genetic or individual or reasons, there are some people who are predisposed for it. And so for those people, there needs to be treatment, but there doesn't need to be a kind of like large scale ban on the sell the sale of al re of recreational alcohol. Right. It's, so that that's where it seems like the humanities and addiction really enters a pretty interesting place, which is just sort of the language of what we think addiction is, whether it's chemical or genetic or medical versus, and, and it's being expressed in any variety of ways, or is it sort of spliced out into these individual things? You know, it's, it's okay if you drink, you know, two pots of coffee a day, but it's not okay if you do X, Y, or Z. That's, it just seems like an interesting way that, that the language matters. Right. I think, I, I think that's true. Um, yeah, thank, thank you. Um, Thank you, and, uh, and so me talking then it spurred Jason to ask a question. I'm going to bring this mm -hmm. in while we took a brief pause. Jason asks, what caused narcotic addiction to become an increasingly police problem during this time? Um, that's a great question, Jason. So we saw a change in the demographics of who was using narcotics. So in the late 1800s, it was mainly women, mainly white women um, who were um, became addicted, um, the, the official term for it is iatrogenic, which just means they were addicted to pharmaceuticals that were prescribed to them. Um, and then you start to see a transition in the population of people who are addicted and a transition from um, medical addiction to, to recreational drug use. And so when the people who are, who are, who are using narcotics are no longer white, you know, middle-class women who are using them, you know, kind of in domestic settings, but they are um, underclass um, in urban areas, then it starts to, be, uh, it starts to be seen as a social threat, as, as really a, a social threat and a, a threat to um, societal organization. And um, the laws kind of cracked down accordingly. And you're absolutely right. And maybe that's where I was trying to take my question, which is, do we apply the term addiction to things that have other contexts, whether it's uh, racial or demographic or ge geographic even? Um, do we call things addictive? Knowing knowing that the medical definition is there or is it the other way around? I'm sorry, I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole. It's just a, it's an interesting <laughs> way that the language is working. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, so I think it definitely like the the bullet point about um, how this this comes into play, you know, more broadly in American history is like there's certainly uh, an intersection between the way that um, different groups who get aligned with particular substances um, tend to then, you know, be the targets of discriminatory um drug laws or policing or things like that. So, um, so, so certainly, you know, I mean, you know, we, when lots of, um, if Chinese folks are smoking opium, then that becomes further justification to exclude them from U.S. citizenship, for example. Um, Thank you. So, so yeah. So that's so that is is definitely a theme throughout the history of of uh, alcohol to alcohol and drugs. Um, to move kind of back to our our wild ride here. Um, so really, from from 1910 until about it reaches its sort of peak at mid century, where um, alcoholism you know, alcohol and tobacco kind of go one way and other drugs, um, you know, cocaine, heroin, things like that um, go the other. Um, and 
so so there's really an efforts an emphasis on the differences between the different drugs um, and that starts to change uh, again really um, around the the 1980s around the 1970s and um, 80s and the um, gradually the, the substances kind of start to come together again and we, we start to see them as manifestations of the same thing and we start to see the revival of some of those kind of um, Victorian and progressive era notions. So it says, so, so this says here, a uh, neo-temperance critique. If you think about uh, campaigns like Mothers Against Drunk Driving that emerged in this time, they sort of revived some of those um, temperance era ideologies and we're really arguing for some more blanket policies to address the harms associated with alcohol use instead of just sort of individual based interventions. Um, they're um, anti-smoking, anti right? So uh, attitudes about smoking shift really, really dramatically in the late 20th century. Um, and in fact, I taught a course on morality, habit and health um, a college course on it and I had we had different habits we had units on different habits and the second time I taught it I had to get rid of smoking because the students all said it was not relatable and really their problem is sleep like they're you know on their devices and they can't go to sleep so um, yeah so so I mean it's it's a it's it's foreign to our students today um, what the attitude about smoking used to be um, but we we start to see that that change happen in the late 20th century. Um, and then perhaps the most significant thing is the brain research that emerges at this time. And there starts to finally be some evidence um, that more or less supports this general inebriety theory that addictions, all ad addictions share certain underlying biological processes. And um, so, and someone said that when we were asking for definitions of addiction, they were like, well, anything that, you know, helps the dopamine flow, the dopamine flow is addictive. So, um, so anyway, so you start to see, so, so we, we have started to see beginning in the late 20th century, a coming back together to emphasis of commonalities between types of addictions. And that brings us to our question, which we'll, we'll pose and talk about this a little bit, and then we'll get into the two sources. Um, so this figure, um, this article was published in 2005. This diagram only goes up to the year 2000. Where do you think the figure would go if we extended it another 20 years? So which direction would that line would go in, do you think? Is it, would it keep going straight? Would it be like a mirror of the, the inebriety era up there? Would it veer in some other direction? Um, Let's give folks a chance to predict this. So what do you think? Uh, so the, the graph on the screen ends in 2000-ish. That's nearly two decades ago. Would that continue on that straight line down or would it veer back to the other side? What do you guys think? Claire, you can take a moment and get a drink and we'll let folks a drink of water. And <laughs> Teresa says, go to the other side. Teresa, go ahead and tell us why you think that, by the way. Why do you think? Tracy's got that look on her face now like the students in her class who raise their hand and give an answer and then realize they're going to be asked for a follow-up. Why do you say the other side, Teresa? Jacqueline says it'll go to the right. All usage is increasing, going up. Oh, uh, yeah, Ter uh, Teresa comes back with technology and distractions. Amanda thinks in the middle. We have a lot more brain-based research, but, and we know about addictions differently now. Teresa says new drugs. Brandon, the question is, if you look at that line, uh, the graph that's going from 1870, it goes sort of straight down in the 19 to 1910, and then it veers all the way to the other side which is the emphasis on the differences. And now in 2000, it's come back to the commonalities. Do you think it will continue to go straight down in the, ne the last two decades, or will it move somewhere on that continuum? 
Jeremiah thinks a straight line. There are scholars today who state drugs are not bad at all, but suggest that's how drug is used that can place it in the negative context. Okay, Claire, uh, we've gotten some feedback here. What do you think? Where do you think it would go? Um, I think I, I think that we are increasingly um, acknowledging that uh, that um, different types of behaviors are are manifestations of addiction. Um, and I also think that some of um, you know, with the opioid crisis um, affecting a lot of white communities and middle class communities, for example, um, I I think that um, that is in a way uh, not to say nor not to say normalizing narcotic use, but I think it's just made it so much more wide widespread that people are 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 there's more of an awareness about it. And um, and and the re and research shows that when people are exposed to other people who have addictions in their communities, then they're more likely to find areas of common ground with them um, and find them and and find them sympathetic. And so I, you know, I I do I do think that it, it that we are are I think we're going in a straight line right now. I mean, remains to be seen. Um, whether yeah whether mr toad's car will will veer to the other side of the road <laughs> yeah right thank you okay so with that um we'll we'll go into looking at the the couple of documents that we have all reviewed so the first is um we're gonna use this history this trajectory of a kind of pendulum or uh, or a car, whatever you know, pick your metaphor. Swinging from an emphasis on commonalities between psychoactive substances to differences between psychoactive substances, um, we're going to take that history and apply it to readings of of two things. And the first one is a political cartoon um, titled "The Drugstore of the Future." This is available online, the U.S. National Library of Medicine Digital Collections. Uh, it was published in 1882 in Puck Magazine, which was kind of the national lampoon of the 19th century. It was one of the very first humor magazines. It was it was really full of satire. Um, and it was published 32 years before national alcohol prohibition. So, um, you know, so it's an imagining of what prohibition might be like were the temperance movement to kind of get their way, published in 1882. So I thought, just thought we'd start by talking about what you notice in this image, um, what strikes you as interesting, um, and then we'll follow that up with talking about what might you draw, your if you were working with this image with students, what might you draw their attention to in light of the the readings and light of the readings that you've done, particular the the kind of uh, narrative sketched in Mr. A. Todd's Wild Ride. Fantastic. That's a very complicated picture. I'm going to give everybody a chance to, yeah. to really linger on it. Um, many of you, if not all of you, are, are accomplished at using primary sources in the classroom. You know the questions to ask, the way to interrogate a source like this. So let's know what you think. What do you see here? What kind of comments do you have? Mary says uh, there's there's a loophole medicinal alcohol. Um, it does it is a little bit like the candy shop in Willy Wonka. Yeah. Joel comments. Yeah. So the medicinal alcohol, I mean, um, it is uh, is is really kind of the the key to the to the picture. So there's this there's this long line waiting to be seen at a quote unquote doctor's office, right? So it's consultation, doctor's office, um, which is really a bar. <laughs> it's a um, small vestibule next to a bar. Um, and the, the physician is, is scribbling prescriptions. Um, and the prescriptions look to be cocktail recipes, right? And the pharmacists back there are bartenders. Um, and they are combining ingredients, including whiskey, bourbon, brandy, um, while patients sit at the bar. 
um, medicating themselves, right? And um, really, it, it, and if you look at the little, the uh, insert, right, in the middle um, of the, the cutout, it's, you can see that saloon has been crossed out and drugstore has been written underneath. So this is essentially a saloon that has been converted into the quote unquote drugstore of the future. So with that kind of overview, let's maybe um, if you could point out some, some details that you see, some things you think are particularly interesting um, and you know, what, what might you wanna point out to students or guide students to see? Well, I'll say one thing that I noticed, um, Claire, is that there are only, well, no, I'm sorry. I was going to say there's only men, but now I see in the back of the line there is a woman. The figurehead over the doctor reminds Mary Oberndorfer of Bacchus. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, you're right, Kayla. So yeah, so we had a comment that they all look like they're they they look like they're pretty well to do. They look fairly well dressed, like they have access to this doctor's office, right, and these prescriptions. Um, That's true, Raina. So, any how calm the room uh, seems from the outside, Claire? If you look at the mm -hmm. inset <laughs> image, it seems very doctor like, right? It seems like a doctor's office. When you get inside, it's a I can only imagine that it sounds like a bar in there. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm noticing now that I hadn't noticed before um, is all of is all of the bottles that are kind of in the foreground there. Yeah. And oh, and someone says real medicines in the foreground are not being given out. <laughs> <laughs> That's for the hangover. Um, what, uh, Claire, do you have any notion of why the the header caption Puck is there? Oh, that's that's the the magazine that it was published ah, got in. It. Got it. Excellent. All great thoughts. Claire, uh, have so, you have so, you used so, this in your teaching? Um, so, so one thing that one of the things that kept coming up in the the text box, um, which I think is uh, um, a, a main, the main point that you know I would want to make if I were using this in a classroom, is that you know I mean the critique is of uh, the temperance movement and prohibition, and it's quite prescient because it seems to suggest that well we can pass a, a law if we pass a law that um, says that, you know, alcohol can only be for medicinal use, then people will just get it, you know, I mean, we'll just turn the saloon into a drugstore and people who have access will sort of find ways to get it. Um, so, I, so, I so, you know, I guess another question that I might ask is, um, is, is whether we see parallel, do we see any parallels with this cartoon and, you know, what's going on with some of our drug laws today? 
Well, we have a lot of participants from California. Yes, we do. Let's see what these folks think. It's all about finding the loopholes. Uh, you're right, Daisy, a little bit like a dispensary. Um, Ginger Park, you're in Colorado. Let's see what folks say here. How do you see this <laughs> race? <laughs> yes. Unintended consequence offers Carol. Prohibition was a terrible failure. Many states first had medical marijuana and are now legalizing to recreational, says Kayla. Yeah, it's an investment. Get it on the bottom and rise to the top, says Jacqueline. I wonder, uh, just in terms of what this political cartoon is saying, Claire, if if the particularly in places like California or Washington or Nevada, Colorado, if if now that distinction is being made at the at the business owner side rather than the well-to-do um, customers there, I wonder if it's those who can get licenses and have the investments to start businesses, basically. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of my understanding is that there's quite a bit of venture capital in um, exactly right and and legalizing marijuana, right? Um, and so, um, so, so yes, yeah, so people will continue to make profit off of these substances, um, and uh, despite prohibition, and people, I think one comment that keeps coming up is loopholes. Like there will always be loopholes. Uh, I guess you know. Um, and someone, somebody just wrote, it looks like business is booming. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, I for this could obviously, this type of cartoon like this could could obviously be used if you're talking about the temperance movement and prohibition and critiques of the temperance movement. But it could also be used in the class if um, to kind of contextualize our more contemporary debates. So if you had some kind of image or news article about um, the medicalization or outright, uh, you know, legalization of um, marijuana in a state, you could look at, I mean, you could look at some of the critiques and, and kind of compare and contrast. And that's one of the things that I think is why the humanities is really, can be really so valuable to thinking through these kinds of issues, because a lot of the debates that we are having now are you know, not new. In fact, you know, more than a century old, um, people were um, warning about what could happen as substances transition from being freely available to being medicalized and, and back again. That's a great point, Claire. Thank you. And of course, once once things are regulated, uh, as Amanda brings up, that does introduce the whole taxation and um, and oversight that comes with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, I I don't know if we um we can move on to the next source I think or so. did, yep. okay. 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 And my my job is also to keep us on time so we have about 25 minutes. Okay. Okay, great. Um So, um, so we talked a little bit about the, that political cartoon, and one of the things that um, Andy kind of asked me to talk about was 
why these sources and why the humanities? And so I hit on that a little bit with the political cartoon in the sense that, you know, I've, I, one of the things I think the humanities can do to these discussions is bring a sense of context that the debates we have over which substances should be medicalized and which substances should be legal and which substances should be completely prohibited um, are not new uh, and that we can put some of those conversations in kind of comparative historical perspective in a meaningful way. Um, and so the, the second source that I had uh, that we all took, to, took a look at is the Billy P Collins poem, The Best Cigarette. And um, Andy asked me earlier why, you know, why use, why a poem? And, you know, I think one of the, the things that poetry can do or literature can do when you're looking at the history of alcohol, drugs, and addiction is um, to, uh, to give you a sense of, uh, try, give the reader a subjective sense of what it maybe felt like to use a particular substance um, at a particular moment in time. And that's something that I think is often sort of missing in the the conversations that we have in say health classes about substances and their physiological effects and their potential risks and dangers, um, you know, is, is um, what is the, um, more, the, the kind of uh, experiential elements of, of using a substance. So, um, so this poem is um, written by Billy Collins, who was a poet laureate in the early 2000s. Um, and rather than have me reread the poem to you, I thought that I would show you a video. So this is um, one of 11 short videos that were produced of Billy Co different Billy Collins poems. Um, they were produced by the ad firm J. Walter Thompson and commissioned by the Sundance Channel. So, um, so this one is the best cigarette. So I thought we could watch this and then talk a little bit about how that history of alcohol and drugs and addiction veering from commonalities to differences might influence the way we read this poem or interpret okay. it. So I'm gonna play this uh, and I'll, I'll let all of our participants know that if for some reason this, we use media quite often in our webinars, but if for some reason this doesn't come through, it doesn't stream clearly for you, you can't hear it well, never fear, it will not be a long clip, but you will have access to these afterwards. So um, I'm gonna play this and Claire and I will be quiet as, as Billy reads his poem and then we'll, we'll come in at the end and discuss. The best cigarette. There are many that I miss, having sent my last one out a car window, sparking along the road one night years ago. The heralded ones, of course, after sex. The two glowing tips, now the lights of a single ship. At the end of a long dinner, with more wine to come, and a smoke ring coasting into the chandelier. Or on a white beach, holding one with fingers still wet from a swim. How bittersweet these punctuations of flame and gesture. But the best were on those mornings when I would have a little something going in the typewriter. The sun bright in the windows, maybe some brilios on in the background. I would go into the kitchen for coffee, and on the way back to the page, curled in its roller, I would light one up and feel its dry rush mix with the taste of dark coffee. Then I would be my own locomotive, trailing behind me as I returned to work. Little puffs of smoke, indicators of progress, signs of industry and thought. The signal that told the 19th century it was moving forward. That was the best cigarette, when I would steam into the study, full of vaporous hope, and stand there, the big headlamp of my face pointed down at all the words in parallel lines. Wow, Claire, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's fun. It's it's much more fun than than one of us reading it, right? <laughs> so, um, so it, if if you all could just tell us, what do you think your sort of um, initial reactions to um, what are your initial reactions to the poems, and what do you think students would 
initially react to. And then we'll, we can talk a little bit about where um, the historiography of, of alcohol and drugs could might come in handy in guiding a discussion about it. Yeah, so we'd love to hear your impressions of that poem. And and I, th I think that likely means also hearing the poem being read, the spoken word. I can tell you, uh, Claire, I, I may have some, I may have some things that I wish I didn't do, but smoking was never, never one of them. I've never smoked much, but I'll tell you, that was a pretty powerful insight to what smoking is like. Carol offers that it's disturbing to associate creative writing with smoking. Brennan, you're right, spoken word's very powerful. Abel, pretty sure smokers can relate a lot more. It's almost romantic, Joel says. It's almost a love song to cigarettes. Ulysses, it does romanticize smoking. <laughs> okay. Teresa says it's pretty accurate. Kayla says, it seemed like he was speaking about the time when he could smoke in ignorance without knowing the terrible physical consequences. Yeah, Brianne, you're absolutely right. Addiction, it does become woven into the fabric of our daily life. It becomes normalized. He's doing all sorts of normal things. He's leading his life and cigarettes, in, this, in Billy's case, the cigarette, this addiction, kind of inserts itself that Jenga stack of his life. He was communing with his addiction. Do you think there's any chance, Claire, that Billy was not a smoker? Oh, I don't know what he, whether he was personally, but... Yeah, um, can you be yeah. a poet and a writer and describe it in that way, but not actually have that? Oh, <laughs> shows how a smoker's brain makes excuses for their habit. That's what... <laughs> Uh, but I guess that's the, the case, Mike, is, and that's what we talked about at the beginning, is that there are things that you wished you weren't doing that you, that you do anyway, and we, we can all be right in our own minds, and we all find ways to justify. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Amanda. Will, you're right. I mean, he did a wonderful job, and... and It's funny, it's so funny how smoking has become, you know, uh, with knowledge, with understanding now, um, has become you know, such a such a negative thing. Um, I can remember in high school, see, it was okay to bring cigarettes to school. Kids brought them to school. They had to stand in the little smoking area. Now it's dueling, says Mary, yeah. That's absolutely right. As with many of our participants, Rye is right on it. She Googled Billy, Phil, uh, Billy Collins, and in fact, he was a smoker. Ah, the debate is settled. <laughs> yeah, the, the Google machine uh, solved that for us. Um, exemplifies the euphoria many smokers receive from their experience. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder if the, the language of that addiction, that romantic um, dependence, would be the same with other kinds of addictions, whether it's you know, the taste of alcohol, uh, whether it's that coffee. I wonder if we if we had if we wrote a a poem to that first cup of coffee in the morning. Could people write equally um, articulate about that feeling? Understanding, of course, that coffee doesn't give you lung cancer, but I just wonder if that that sense, that euphoria uh, would be there. If so, is it the addiction that he's describing more than the fact that the cigarette is just the vehicle for that addiction? Well, the first part of the poem is really, um, 
talk it's really very nostalgic right it's talking about all of the associations he has with the between the substance and memories and the memories like all of the people who say oh they're you know they're so romantic and things like that i mean yes they're very evocative um memories um but i i don't see i don't can i jump into what i would emphasize if i were teaching this course, poem please. or is that okay um so you know what what I really think, where I really think alcohol and drugs history comes in handy is this moment, right? Um, so the beginning is all very nostalgic. And I think if I were teaching this poem to teenagers, I think that they would, even young people get nostalgia. In fact, they, I mean, maybe they get it even more acutely. Like, you know, I think it's like nostalgic for fifth grade when I was in sixth grade or something like that. But, um, you know, so so I think that they would they would get the whole romantic part at the beginning where smoking is woven into these um, these the, the kind of scenes that he paints. But when there's the shift right at the end, which is I'm like re reaching back to my, you know, high school English teacher roots um, as the Volta or whatever, uh, right before the conclusion, I would be my own locomotive. I really think that that is where alcohol and drugs history, knowing that kind of um, Mr. A. Todd's trajectory that we talked about can come in handy because um, when tobacco breaks off from all of the other substances, it does become a kind of indicator of progress, right? Like of liberation for the women who do it. It's associated with industrial progress, with modernization. It's with liberation. It's the signal that told the 19th century it was moving forward. Um, and so, yeah, so so that was when it was the best, it was the best cigarette. And I think someone pointed this out in the comments where it was this poem is about how he could look back <laughs> how he misses a period in time when he could smoke sort of blissfully unaware of the consequences. But it is, it's, it's locating, so this is written in what, the early, early mid 19, early mid 1990s. So everybody knows smoking is bad for you, but it's a particular historical moment that it's not so far removed to him, to, to having access to a vision of smoking that was something quite different. Um, and I think students could get like the nostalgic parts in the beginning, but in order to really get the end of the poem, it's, it is helpful to know a little something about the history of alcohol and drugs. Did you ever use this in the classroom, Claire? Um, I, I thought about what well, my morality habit in health class. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Rachel, I see that you've offered, um, it looks like probably a, uh, a pretty long poem. Rachel, can you give us a citation for that? Oh, thank you. Wow. All right, we've got about 10 more minutes, Claire. Okay, so um, I, I did want to have some time at the end here to be for, to talk about um, what are some suggestions for texts that you think could benefit from this historical context um, of thinking about um, addictions uh, to substances or behaviors as being unified to um, being separate and distinct entities depending on the substance. Um, so, you know, we looked at a cartoon briefly, we looked at a poem. Can you think of any text that you use in your class or that you might bring into your class that could, um, you know, could, could benefit from being put into conversation with this history? You know, earlier tonight, uh... I think it was Ulysses mentioned uh, music. Music is text. Uh, 
old commercials offers, Mike? Do you have any in particular ones in mind? Well, there are an awful lot of tobacco commercials, cigarette smoking commercials. Mm -hmm. Go ask Alice. <laughs> the Godfather, Marlboro Man. I don't know the talking dog commercial smoking weed. Thanks, Mary. Cartoon on Drunkard's Progress. Oh, that one's great. Oh, Rachel, I remember that very well. I think there was a there was a whole promotional set around the the your drugs on your drugs your brain on drugs <laughs> uh, promotion parts of the stoner movies old radio commercials especially the ones the doctors tell you to let smoke into your t into your t zone your throat <laughs> we must have grown up in north carolina <laughs> Yeah, I think I remember so many uh, tobacco ads, smoking commercials. Joe Camel, absolutely. Yeah, the suggestion for the connections between drugs and propaganda, that might be, that could be a great kind of um, document-based question, for example, if you could pull out a lot of different um, visual images, right, um, to look at, and look at that. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to keep, <laughs> I'm, Andy, I'm supposed to let you look at the, yeah, the ticker yeah, of comments, but um, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of getting away from me here. Oh, yeah, Virginia Slims, I Love Lucy. I wonder how much geography also uh, influences this. I made a little bit of a joke with Lee because I, I know he's in eastern North Carolina, but um, you know, tobacco is a, a different culture in the South than it is other parts of the country. Thank you, Jeremiah, for sharing those resources from Smithsonian Mag. Yeah, you're absolutely right, uh, Lee Holder. Mm -hmm. It was Duke Tobacco Money that uh, that named Duke University. Claire, were there some other texts that you uh, you chose too? These are fantastic texts, but were there any others that you considered? Um, those were those were the two that I chose because I thought that they were they were sort of like bite sized enough to um, to cover in a in a webinar. Right. Um, but but I I think that you know uh, I I think that there are a variety of of texts that could benefit from yeah. knowing kind of where they fit in the larger history of, of, of alcohol and drugs. Um, I think certainly some of the things that get taught, like um, like Upton Sinclair's The Jungle and the Progressive Era, if you put that in conversation with some of the historical uh, historiography of, of the history of alcohol and drugs and addiction, um, that, that could be really fascinating. Um, a lot of folks are saying um, things about, uh, are saying ad campaigns. And I, I think that, um, one of the things we did in the Summer Institute too was to look at prescription dra drug ad campaigns um, from the, the 1960s. And so I, so I think, you know, ad campaigns can be a, a wonderful way to analyze kind of um, value and propaganda and also, um, you know, it can benefit from 
a kind of larger awareness of what were the attitudes about these particular substances at the time. Yeah, so um, with that, um, if anybody, by the way, you have my email from the first slide. And so if anyone uses any texts that uh, work really well in your classroom, I would love to hear about it. Um, and feel free to, to follow up with me if, if you have questions or, um, you know, want suggestions about incorporating this thing into particular units or activities. So um, I, with that, I think I think we have time for, for just a quick wrap up and, and a, a, a final shot question. So, so the conclusion is really, you know, that I, I hope that the histories of alcohol, drugs, and addiction in America gives us a really essential context for better understanding our contemporary readings of substance use um, so that the ways that we think about um, you know, all, all of the uh, addictions that we encounter on our day-to-day -day -day basis and the way we think about the opiate epidemic and the way we think about the legalization, um, the growing legalization of marijuana, that all of those things have a longer history um, and that that history gives us a richer understanding of the moment that we're currently living in. Thanks, Claire. And I'm, we've got just a few minutes left. I'm going to invite uh, all of you to ask any uh, last questions. I've got a couple of questions for you, though, Claire. Um, and you know, I guess one of them is is the choice. Tell me about the choices. Tell us about the choices in this kind of work that you make. The distinctions that you might make between addiction for the individual. In other words, the poem Billy Collins was very first person, very you know, very much about his relationship with this substance versus the community and the ways that addiction impacts or is a part of the fabric of any given community, however that's defined. Which of those, I, I don't know that it's an either or either, by the way, but which of those seems to be um, the most accessed through the humanities? Oh, I think we need both. And I think the humanities are, are essential for both because, um, I think without that kind of for a subjective first person account, then it gets uh, very hard for people to get into the minds and experiences of people who use drugs and different per different types of substances. And then when you can locate them in history, it gives you an understanding of the context that they're operating in. Um, and it, then it becomes harder to judge people as being immoral or bad or making bad decisions, or it just gives you a window into the way that they see their world and um, the way their drug use felt and maybe what drove it. So I think that that's, I think that's ab that the first person accounts are absolutely essential. Um, on the other side of things, I also think that, you know, the humanities can benefit public debate because I think often it's hard for people to, um, numbers can be cold. I mean, even when they're staggering, right? Um, even when you look at the, you know, the number of X amounts of overdose deaths or things like that, that should strike us as quite tragic. Um, I think, you know, the, that the humanities can can provide some kind of some some depth to the epidemiology um, and some richer sense of the kind of cultural and social issues that uh, are driving it. So. So I, I, I think the humanities are, are absolutely uh, essential to understanding both public and, and private or personal dimensions of addiction. Um, uh, absolutely. I think those two things really do go hand in hand. Claire, I know that uh, tonight we focus really explicitly on um, the, the prism of American history with this conversation around addiction. Um, I don't want to go too far in the margins, but how, how is this same topic addressed in other countries or in a global sense? Oh, um, I don't know. That's, that, it, that, that's just a massive question. And, um, I, I, um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I really, I don't, I don't feel qualified to answer it, honestly, <laughs> since I'm, I'm sort of an Americanist by training, but, um. Well, uh, so <laughs> let me reframe that a little bit then. Um, the OAH, the conference this year is in Philadelphia, everyone, by the way. Um, the OAH has a subgroup on on this this field. Is the same true internationally? Are there other historians in other countries looking at similar questions? 
Yes, and, and actually, um, the Alcohol and Drugs History Society that I mentioned at the beginning and, and kind of showed you their journal and blog outlets, they are an international organization. So um, we get folks from all over. Um, and you and and that's I mean, that's and, and those conferences are really have been my main point of exposure to people who are looking on these questions, looking at these questions in very different national contexts. Right. Are there any other? Uh, it's funny. There's an ironic um, uh, ending to this last shot. Anyone uh, last call? For <laughs> last call for questions. Any other questions uh, that we have tonight? Um, if you do, I would encourage all of you to visit Claire's website and use her email address. I don't think it was an idle invitation to reach out and stay in touch. Um, and of course, uh, you can also go through me or Libby if you want to get in touch with Claire and find out more about her work. Claire, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really do appreciate your your guidance and your expertise on this. Um, thank you, Claire. Oh, Andy, thank you so much for having me. And I want to thank all of our participants tonight for joining us for tonight's webinar. Um, again, this is work after work, and I, I recognize the time that you spend with us, and I hope that it's always relevant and useful for your teaching. I hope that the, uh, the materials that we share and the conversations we have can inform the ways that you address both your curriculum and the culture and the climate of your classroom. Uh, please follow us on social media. Our uh, Facebook and our Twitter feeds both um, have regular updates on upcoming events that will include the applications for next year's Teachers Advisory Council in April will also include an announcement for the nearly 30 webinars that we've scheduled for the 2019-2020 uh, webinar series um, calendar. So please follow us on social media and you can you know, get updated uh, and receive updates on that. Again, tonight when I close the room, you'll receive a survey and once you've completed that survey, you can download your certificate. I'd encourage you to take uh, handle all those and you can turn them into your um, into your administration all at once. If there's anything in that certificate that needs to be customized for you and your district and the regulations and requirements that you have, please reach out to Libby or myself. Uh, I hope to see you at our next webinar, uh, Thursday, March the 7th. Next week, we'll be uh, working with uh, really uh, an elite scholar in the field of Jefferson um, history. We're working with Annette Gordon-Reed, who's a professor of history at Harvard University, also on the Board of Trustees of the National Humanities Center. She will be discussing uh, her work in recovering lives at Jefferson's Monticello. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a great day at school tomorrow. We'll see you next time at the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night. <laughs>